It was what the prophet Micah would call the least among the clans of Judah, south of Jerusalem, west of the Salt Sea. Heads of wheat bowed to the blades of harvest, grapes glistened in the afternoon sun, sheep stumbled along the stony high grounds. Here Jacob would gain a son and bury his beloved Rachel. Ruth would find refuge in the barley fields. Samuel would find a king among the shepherds. Shepherds would find a king among the sheep. Soon the tramp of soldiers' feet would fill the silence. Mothers would mourn the lost sons of Bethlehem. The holiness of one night in the little town would be stolen by the sword. But all was not lost. One would survive. Like Ruth, he would wander without a home. Like Boaz, he would provide bread for those in need. Like David, he would come from a humble beginning. Like the children who were lost, he would be pierced by a sword. And through the innocence of his death, this son of Bethlehem would become our peace. Greetings in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. This is our KISS service. I'm Pastor Witt. Today we're going to talk about a rest in darkness awaiting peace to emerge. I thank you for your love and grace and for your care for other people, the ministries that you're doing. I thank you for the tithes and offerings and sacrifices that we've received. Um, some folks have sent in their estimate of giving cards. Uh, if you could go ahead and get those into us as soon as possible. We're trying to go ahead and complete that process before the end of the year. If you need to catch up on your offerings, this is a great time of the year as we're coming into uh, to the end of the year to, to try and get everything uh, reconciled and taken care of. Also, if you've been touched by what's going on across our nation, uh, wish to make a special offering, uh, second mile offering to uh, UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, for those people that have been hurt by the, uh, by the tornadoes. Go ahead and send that in and indicate that that's where you want it to go, and we'll take care of that. Something you may not know about the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, um, Zero amount of the money that's given to UMCOR is used for administration. That's all paid for by another, another mechanism. Uh, the federal government during Katrina came to us and said, we'd like to give you tens of millions of dollars to deal with the Katrina. We hear that uh, you don't charge any administration on that money. And we said, yeah, that's true. And they quite literally gave us tens of millions of dollars to to pour into the Katrina-ridden uh, area. I don't know if they'll do that again, but United Methodist Committee on Relief is a phenomenal way. Um, all the other organizations that you're going to use, they're going to they're going to charge you some money for administration. But the United Methodist Committee on Relief doesn't do so. So, end of the year offerings. Thank you. 
in advance. Uh, if you want to make a special offering to the church, that's fantastic. Today, um, obviously, we're going to be talking about peace. And uh, as we begin our, our discussion about peace and our worship of God, I want you to understand that the peace that we're talking about is not detente. It's not the cessation of um, aggression. It actually is something a great deal more. And we'll talk about that. How about we give, begin our worship then by taking a couple moments to center ourselves on Christ. I'd invite you to, uh, to talk to the Lord for a second as we begin our worship. Let us pray. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship today um, is taken from a very well-known hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea bellows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and have shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sins, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sins, not in part, but in whole, are nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. It is well, it is well. With my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is well, with my soul. Let us pray. You created light out of darkness, ate our focus and worship on you. Bring us peace to our developing relationship with you. Help us trust you and have faith enough in you to take a little light out into our lives. May your peace be enough to move us to lift your light in the darkness for others. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning um, is John chapter 14. Uh, 1 through 7, 15 through 17, and 27, the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus is getting ready to leave. And he, um, he turns to his disciples and has a conversation. I've said this many times. This is a piece of scripture that I've used countless times uh, in my ministry at funerals. And um, my presumption is that as we leave... A person if we know that it's going to be the last time or a very long time until we see them again then the last things that we say to them are very very important and these are some of the last words that Jesus has with his disciples Jesus said let not your hearts be troubled believe in God believe also in me in my father's house there are many dwelling places if it were not so, would I have told you to go, that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to the place where I am going. You've got to love Thomas. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. If you had known me, if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
If you love me, agape me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father to give you another advocate, counselor, to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot re receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. My peace, shalom, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for just a second. Lord, I would ask that you would open us to receive from you, open us to share with you. Share with us something new today that we need to hear that would move us along in our relationship with you, that, that would regenerate us back into what you originally designed and desired for us to be. Most of all, I would ask that our conversation with you this morning, our thoughts about you and about other things would lead us to becoming more faithful people as we deal with hope, love, joy, and peace in this world and bring your kingdom into this world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I have a couple questions for you. Actually, this morning I'm going to have quite a few. What if Advent is a time of preparation for the coming of the one who offers true peace? What if Advent is a time of preparation for the coming of the one kept in darkness of a wound for nine months? What if Advent is a time of preparation for the coming of God in the form of a baby vulnerable and in need of care? That is, care from those for whom he would offer care and peace. Uh, you know, the, the word peace, when we say this, as each of these words, hope, love, joy, and peace, when we talk about them inside the church, they are not normal words. They, they do not resonate the common meanings that exist outside the church. That's certainly true for love. We've talked about it every week. Hope. Love, joy, peace, these things, these are not common words. And the way that we use them and the meaning that we mean from them and for them is vastly different than, than what people on the, the common road of life use them to mean. Oftentimes, peace is thought of as, I said earlier, detente, a, um, a, a cessation uh, of, of violence and the word peace that we use means something entirely different. I want to read you something that, uh, that I plucked out of one of my books. Though most commonly translated as peace, shalom holds a much deeper meaning for the Jewish people from whom we borrowed the word. Much more than the absence of conflict. Shalom implies a sense of completeness and wholeness. The word derives from the word, from the verb, S-H-A-L-E-M, shalom, which suggests a fullness and oneness in body, mind, and state of life. You know, if you go to Israel, um, you'll hear this word shalom quite often. It's a greeting and it's also a goodbye. When you greet someone, you'll say shalom. And as you prepare to leave them, you'll say shalom, shalom. It's the speaking of a blessing, but it's also the speaking of a hope. That when you meet somebody, that the conversation that you're going to have is one of completeness and wholeness, one of honesty. And that when you leave, you're placing a blessing on the person so that as they move away from you, that they will continue to live in shalom and continue to bump into people who also are living in shalom. Shalom 
is not the absence of conflict. I said for some time, and for me, I think the easiest way to understand this, it's, it's like a clock. When all of the cogs of the clock are aligned properly, the clock runs well. This is Shalom. Shalom for you or for me is that all the cogs of our lives are, are completely aligned perfectly and everything moves as it's supposed to. The opposite of peace is chaos. I want to say that again. The opposite of peace is actually chaos. What if our need for peace can only be fulfilled by God? Now, I'm well aware that many of us believe that we can find peace in other ways. Um, but what if that's not true? What if I was to say to you that being really aggressive with another entity and holding it at spear point so that it is not aggressive towards us has nothing to do with peace at all? See, peace is the ability of the things that are relating to one another to be in proper relationship. The kind of relationship that exists between parents and children oftentimes is not real peace. Peace doesn't exist until the child gets old enough to make its own choices and the parent gets secure enough to allow the child to make its own choices and then the child makes choices to be in relationship with the parent in a way that the cogs fit together and things work well. This is a description of a relationship inside the Bible between parents and children, between husband and wife. The, the kind of the kind of relationship that existed between man and woman early on, there was no peace in it. Because the man took on a, a relationship of being over the woman. And in that relationship, there is no peace. But when the two become one, which is what the Bible talks about, when the two become one and not one over the other, then the probability of peace begins. I think this is what God meant when oftentimes, if you read the scriptures, you know, Jesus said, I no longer call you, but I call you brother. I no longer call you servant. I now call you brother. I think this is what Jesus is talking about. It's about having relationships which move us to being able to relate to one another in a free will kind of a situation and yet still have perfect relationship one with the other. What would you offer for such a peace? What would you give for true peace? I want you to think about that for a moment in your life. I know there are relationships in your life that are not peace filled. You may have a less than perfect relationship with your spouse with your children, with your parents, with people at work. What would you offer? What would you offer to have shalom, wholeness, completeness in relationship inside yourself and outside yourself? Many of us have those internal battles within ourselves. We, we have those things that create lots of dark days for us inside ourselves and external to that with other folks. What if, what if it were to be offered to you and to me, that is peace, offered free of charge? What if with only the stipulation it would be offered to us, with only the stipulation that, that we had to live into it in our own lives? that you and I are to be a part of offering that same peace to other people. What if that were offered to you? Free of price. See, I think this is true. I was listening to, to someone talk this past week and, and reading another book, and, and it brought back up one that I read uh, many years ago, which uh, was quite frankly a discussion from 
100 years ago or so of another theologian, uh, Cheap Grace. See, there are many people who approach God from the standpoint of getting what I call chit, chit theology, getting a, a thing that enables them to, to get into heaven, this little thing. I reject that. Uh, I reject that uh, wholeheartedly. I do not believe that Jesus came to offer us something that would simply get us into heaven. Um, in fact, I've had many conversations with, with people who have said to me, if that's the reality, then I'll wait until I'm about to die. And then I'll make that bargain with God. Take the chit and step over. Of course, then I've had a conversation, what happens if you die and you don't have a chance? Uh, but... What would you be willing to offer for true peace? For the, uh, the antithetical situation of chaos, what would you offer? I know that your life is chaotic. If it's not, then I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what you're doing about understanding the world around you because without a doubt, the world around us is phenomenally chaotic. And if your life is like my life, that chaos around seeps into my personal kind of life. If not between in my relationships with my wife and my children and friends, certainly within my own mind and the conflicts about how I want to deal with other people. Um, what if God created everything? And what if God created you and also created me and all the people around you? What if God offered God's self in human form to offer you, me, all humanity, a way out of darkness and chaos? What if the coming of Jesus Christ in that baby form I love that vision. I heard this back uh, three or four months ago during a um, a webinar about Advent. One of the people said, you know, Jesus, Jesus was in darkness for nine months before he was born. And I never thought of that before, God being in darkness. It drug me back to the creation story where there's that discussion about what God creates on the first day. By the way, God does not create the sun on the first day. God creates on the first day the possibility. You got a lot of phone calls in the middle here, sir. <laughs> what if God actually created everything? All. What if God created you and me? And what, what if God, in that creation, gave us free will and we chose another way other than following God and God was not satisfied with that? And God then uh, began to chase after us. And what if God came into the world and offered God's self in human form? Um offered humanity a way out of darkness and out of chaos. This thought process that, um, that God spent nine months in a womb, in the darkness of a womb. For me, um, I heard someone say that uh, back several months ago when I was in a, uh, in a webinar about Advent and that really grabbed me that, that God came into the world through darkness um, and then certainly one could say that Jesus understood chaos very very well after living in the world that he lived in um, and then dying on the cross that he understood chaos and darkness and um, what if that was God's way to bring us back into relationship with God back into relationship with self, back into relationship with others, back into relationship with creation. What if it's the only one true way out of chaos and out of darkness? See, 
in the beginning when God created heavens and the earth on that first day, what he actually created, what God actually created that first day was not the sun, even though there's day and night. It's not the sun. What God creates on that first day is a place where God may exist and a place where God may not exist. What's called light and dark. Theological locations, real locations. And God placed us in the light. And we determined that we wanted to go our own way. And it ends up bringing chaos into the world. But God loves us enough in that original story, in that, you know, believe it if you want to believe it, see it as uh, just a, a kind of a story that describes God's love. But I love that story because God actually sacrifices some of God's creation to make clothing for us and then takes us out of the garden and places us in a place where it's more chaotic. Uh, go and read the scriptures. It says that the world at that point will become adversarial toward us. Uh, and, and certainly if you've read the Bible or you've studied history, uh, you know that, that adversaries and adversarial relationships is something that that very much has taken place throughout history. Um, what if what God is offering us is a place without marginalization, without lost? What if it's a place without a lack of direction, the lost, the least, the lost? What if it's a place without loneliness where people are no longer alone. What if this place is filled, this, this, this theological place, but more than that, it's a spiritual dimension that grows in one's life and around one and gets filled in as a person gets closer and closer to God, gets filled in with more hope, love, joy, and peace, and it begins to it begins to offer things that that outside in the darkness cannot offer and being the least the lost the the lonely begins to fall away not only for us but also for other people because we become people who reach out and take care of the marginalized those without direction those that are lonely Who in your life has loved you the most? Who in your life has loved you the most? I want you to understand that it's Jesus Christ, that it's God. God created you. God designed you. God placed you in this world. And God loves you enough that God died for you. God offered you not only life of humanity, of breathing, but also of spiritual life. We, we have two births. We have, this is what Nicodemus and Jesus were, dis were discussing there in Jerusalem at night. And Nicodemus had a really difficult time grasping it. He went at it from a different direction of... Um, being born again, being entering into a mother's womb. And Jesus was trying to describe to him that, that there are two births. There is a birth of physicality, and then there is a spiritual birth that comes when one enters into the, the closer relationship with God. What if God offers you a rebalancing of scales? Not only for your rights and wrongs that you've done in this world, but also inside of you internally to rebalance you as a human being. And what if God offers you direction by relationship? And the chaotic direction that you have gone in for years can begin to be wiped away. Some of you exist day after day in such chaos. There's... There's just not much direction going on for you, and you need you need a GPS, a map. You you need God to come and to help to bring you 
into an understanding of the way that you need to go. Inside of my writings for the liturgy over the past seven weeks, I've talked about the way. Over the past year, I've talked about it in sermons over and over. There is a way that exists in relationship with God. Can you believe that such a thing exists? If you can get to the point where you desire to believe such a thing, you have begun to step in the direction of allowing it to become true. Because wanting to want to believe is enough to get started on the pathway. I think that the, the questions that we should pose as a person of God are, are we helping to advance peace or not? both in ourselves and out of ourselves. Are we an agent of Christ or not? Has our baptism meant anything to us or not? Are we living into a baptism or not? See, I don't believe that a Christian is a perfect person. Uh, if a Christian is a perfect person, then I'm not a Christian. Because there are still a lot of things broken about me. I share that with you on a regular basis. Maybe I shouldn't. Certainly there are a lot of pastors that would never share that. But I'm a broken person. I have things about me that really, they disturb me. And I suspect they disturb other people. Um, truth to be told, everyone's the same. I'd like to be more like my wife. She's one of the best people that I know. Um, but I'm not. And God is still working on me, and I am still working with God on me. And my buddies, my friends, my family are still working on me, with me, for me and for others and for God. And the question that I ask is, are you living into your baptism or not? Your baptism is calling you to a particular direction, a particular way. Maybe you need to, to get a hymn and go back and read what it was that you said at your baptism. And I ask the question, have we experienced enough hope and enough, enough love and enough joy that we can begin to enter into a sense of peace? I will say to you that these words are actually lined up in a progression. Hope, in my mind, is the first thing that you need in order to begin to experience the others. Love. And then joy. And then finally, peace. Advent is a season where we take on these words, we, we live with these words, we look at these words, and we prepare for the second coming of Jesus and we prepare for the birth of Jesus to celebrate happy birthday, Jesus. And we check ourselves to see how we're doing with this baby that came into the world vulnerable in need of humanity's help that leaves the world helping humanity. I know you need help. I know you need God. You know you need God. My hope for today is that you're in the process of living into your baptism. That you're in the process of living into what God designed and wanted you to be. And that you're receiving hope, love, joy, and peace as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Lord, help us. Help us to live into our baptism. Help us to understand more clearly over time what that means. Not that becoming a Christian means that we become it all at one time, but that we are on a, a way and that we are moving in a direction of becoming more and more and more what you design us to be. And as more of us become that, then your influence and your kingdom becomes larger and larger on the earth. I know the adversary is working hard against you and certainly we can see 
the adversary's effect on the world too. Help us, Lord, during this season to enjoy each other, to enjoy the red coat theology. I don't want to throw it out the window. I just don't want it to be preeminent in my life. I want you to be the number one thing in my life during this time of the year. Help me, Jesus. Help us, Jesus, to celebrate you. Bless the people around us that are hurting. Help us to share what we have, what's been given from you with other people. To empower their lives to, to be better. And help us to feel good about doing so. For those folks that are hurting because of the storms, because of poverty, because of loss, because of lack of direction. Come, Jesus, through the power of your Spirit to minister to their needs. In your holy name we pray. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May you have a great week. Let me remind you that on Christmas Eve, there will be two services. One at five, one at nine. And the two Sundays following that, the first Sunday of Christmas and the second Sunday of Christmas, the two Sundays following Christmas, there will be one service each week at 10 o'clock with no Sunday school. Be a blessing for others. Receive your blessing. Amen. Amen. Go into the world and do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you.